Hello to you friends, this is Stammer on Air, but first the daily early Buddhist contemplation. All beings are born and created by the Kama. They are formed, shaped, conditioned, elevated and restricted by their Kama. These past actions, this past behavior, is a womb of probability from which they re-emerge. All beings are owners of their karma, debtors to their karma, and they inherit their karma. Whatever they do, whether good or bad, the later effects of that will be theirs only. This accumulation of probability follows them like a shadow of the past that never leaves. Therefore does this karma come to divide all beings into high and low, beautiful or ugly, worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha, consummated in knowledge and behavior, totally transcended, expert in all dimensions, knower of all worlds, unsurpassable trainer of those who can be trained, both teacher and guide of gods as well as of humans, blessed, exalted, awakened, and perfectly self-enlightened, was the blessed Buddha. Perfectly formulated is this Buddha Dhamma, visible right here and now, immediately effective, timeless, inviting each and every one to come and see for themselves, inspect, examine, and verify, leading each and every one through progress towards perfection, directly observable, experienceable, and realizable by each intelligence, perfectly training is this noble Sangha community of the Buddha's noble disciples. They are training the right way, the true way, the good way, the direct way. Therefore do these eight kind of individuals, these four noble pairs, deserve both gifts self-sacrifice, offerings, hospitality, and reverential salutation with joint palms. Since this noble Sangha community of the Buddhist noble disciples is an unsurpassable and in, indeed forever unsurpassed field of merit in this world, for this world, to honor, respect, support, uphold, and protect. Thank you. Hello to you, friends. 
This is Dhamma on Air number 59, which could be called the baited hook or hooked on hedonism. There are three questions, one Dhamma story, one simile, but as usual, first the normal intro. Namo. Tasso. Pakavatto. Arahatto. Samma Sambuddhasa. Worthy. Honorable. And perfectly self enlightened. Was the Bliss Buddha. The simile of the bait, which is from Samyutta Nikaya, you see the Samyutta Nikaya here, the connected discourses of the Buddha, uh, the Sutta or the thread or the small speech called the fisherman. It's a simile of a fisherman. He goes out into a deep lake and then he throws out a baited hook. And then there's a very hungry fish urging for sense pleasure and it bites the hook. As soon as bites the hook, the fisherman pulls up the fish and then he can do with whatever he wants. Eventually, because he's also hungry for taste, then he kills the fish to eat the fish. So is it, this bait on the hook is the, the Buddha, he likened to the six sense objects. Whatever can be seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched, and thought of, cognized, such as idea and mental states. These sense objects, they are all desirable, lovely, interesting, alluring, agreeable, tantalizing. And because they are that, one craves for them. One wants them very dearly, and one clings to them. This craving is what's create suffering. And another sutta, the Buddha, he points out that beings are devoured, they're eaten by sense pleasure, because that was drive them towards death. While plucking these flowers, collecting and plucking these flowers of daily sense pleasures, one is caught up by death who comes from behind, slowly but steadily, and it starts at the moment of birth. So this hot pursuit of sense pleasure every day, scanning, hoping, planning to the next sense pleasure, is what usually conscious beings are using their entire life on, while time is ticking and death is coming up from behind. So death catches up, of course, eventually. While these worthy conscious beings has been allured and tantalized by this hot pursuit, this hunting and scanning for sense pleasure. Imagine, for example, in your daily life, you, you get out of bed, then you wait for breakfast, then this is the high point, the next high point of the day. Go to work, then you look at the watch, ah, what, when is lunch coming up? Lunch break, huh? or coffee break, or tea break, it's all something induced by sense pleasure. Usually, in this case, sense pleasure on the tongue. Then going home, you, you again look, ah, when can I go home from work so I can go home and eat dinner, sense pleasure. After dinner, ah, when can I look at television or play computer games or see films? Again, sense pleasure, visual sense pleasure. At the end of the week, one is urging for the weekend. Again, for the sense pleasures the weekend can give. And in the winter time and at all, at all times when it's urging for holidays to get out of the boring monotony of, of daily work. So all this is urging for sense pleasures. As soon as one has finished one sense pleasure, one is scanning for a new sense pleasure. So this is basically what most beings use their conscious life on. I read aloud the, the Bali Sika Sutta, the Fisherman's Sutta from Samyutta Nikaya, uh, number 35, uh, Sutta number 189. And it goes like this. So, this 
hooked on hedonism. Hedonism is, is basically the point Mara makes that this sense pleasure is the highest happiness, which is not the truth, because Nibbana is the highest happiness. But this hook of sense addiction, that creates fear, because as soon as you are hooked on something, you want something very dearly, then you also cling to it, even before you get it. And as soon as there's cling, there's also fear and panic of losing this sense pleasure, losing the spouse and thereby access to sex, losing the money and thereby access to all sense pleasure money can buy. So this is an inevitable boomerang echo effect uh, of sense pleasure, this urge for sense pleasure. So there's a retribution for that, that is just fear and this suffering induced by craving and then clinging. So, the fisherman sutra goes like this. The blessed Buddha once said, Bikus. Imagine a fisherman who has thrown down a baited hook in a deep lake, and then a yearning fish, hungry for food, would swallow it at first sight. That fish, having swallowed the fisherman's hook, would indeed meet with much pain, disaster and tragedy since the fisherman would do with it just as he wishes. So too, because there are these six doors in the world for the pain, disaster and tragedy of beings, for the slaughter of living beings, forms experienceable by the eyes, sounds experienceable by the ears, smells experienceable by the nose, tastes experienceable by the tongue, touches experienceable by the body, and mental states experienceable by the mind, such as orgasm and intoxicated mental states. These sensations are all seductive, gorgeous, alluring, agreeable, pleasing, interesting, tempting, and tantalizing. If a bhikkhu search for the light in them, welcomes them, and thus remains clinging to him. He's called a bhikkhu who has swallowed Mara's hook. He has met with pain, disaster, and tragedy, and the evil one can do with him as he wishes. However, one who does neither hunt for delight in them, nor welcome them, nor does he remain clinging to them. Such bhikkhu is called one who has resisted Mara's hook, who has broken, destroyed, and defeated this hook. He will neither gather, nor meet any pain, nor disaster, nor charity, and this evil one cannot do with him as he wishes, since he has gained true self-control, self-control and integrity. The Bliss Buddha also said in the Udana, in the Inspirations, number two, Blissful is being without passions in this world. Blissful is the overcoming of all sense pleasures. So this is uh, this craving, which we know there is three, is craving for sense pleasure, craving for becoming this and that, craving for not becoming all the undesirable things as sick, poor, dead. This number one craving is this craving for sense pleasure. The Buddha likened to a baited hook that if you're hooked on that one, you're hooked on death, on suffering, on despair, on panic, on fear. Despite that, that is what drives most beings, conscious beings, whether animal, human or higher, or lower. It's this yearning, urging for these tantalizing sense pleasures. difficult one to break. The Buddha, he, he used meditation and first when he got this another sense pleasure which was higher than sense pleasures by the eye and so on, he got the first jhana, the first meditative absorption, then he could, he could get rid of this sense pleasure for the six sense objects, namely visible forms, hearable sounds, smellable smells, tasteable tastes, touches, and mental states. So much for hedonism and sense pleasure and the yearning for them. 
We go to the questions. Question 185. What is Hadaya Vattu? Hadaya Vattu. Vattu means base or ground or uh, story or basis. And Hadaya means heart. It's a mistaken commentary expression of the heart base as base for the physical base for consciousness. It is not found in the in it's only found in the commentaries. It's not found in the Tipitaka. The Buddha though in the Tipitaka was speech of thoughts uh, and of actions as something coming from the mind, coming from the heart, just as we speak of it. Ah he he's done this and that in a very hot headed or very emotional uh, moment, then we say, ah, it comes from the heart. It doesn't mean that it, literally speaking, comes from the heart. It's a figurative speaking. So therefore, the, the commentaries are st somewhat excused then, then they post a the heart as a physical basis of consciousness. Actually, in the canonical text, is is said that in the Patanas, we are saying that that material thing based on which mind element and mind consciousness element functioned. That is the base of consciousness. So the heart is not mentioned in the Tipitaka. Buddha never said so. So it's a commentarial and mistaken commentarial expression based on uh, colloquial popular sayings. But at that time also, at the commentary's time, they believed actually that the heart was a, the base of the mind. So you were thinking with the heart. Uh, and I thought the brain was a, a gland that produced the, the mucus, the snot. And this, this then produced, then also Buddha, he, he spoke of the coming from the heart like expressions of thoughts and actions, which were very emotional or passionate. And then this created this uh, mistake. But the Buddha never said that consciousness was created in the heart. Are there other, the next question goes, uh, did the Buddha say there are other vatus? If so, uh, what, what are these? They're, they're the physical basis of the six senses, uh, that is the eye, the ear, and so on. They are mentioned as vatus, a physical base of these senses. It is not meant actually the physical heart. Uh, it is used, it's, they are said kind of like uh, Chakupasada is, means the platform of materiality, which is the base for seeing, for visible forms. So if we should take the eyesight just first, then uh, it's not the physical eye itself that can see, that is sensitive to light. The light comes in through the eye, I saw some drawings of here, then it hits the retina, which is a sensitive, light sensitive uh, organ at, this, at the back of the eye. And there some cells are uh, rods and cones, and they, inside these rods and cones, close to the cellular membrane, is a, a seven helix membrane pro protein called rhodopsine. And when the rhodopsines are hit by light, by photons, then it starts to wriggle its tail. And this creates a membrane instability, which mean, gives rise to some influx of ion, usually calcium ions, and this will then propagate the, the nerve signal. So it's right there that the consciousness arises, the visual consciousness. So it's this Chakupasada means the, the platform, the physical platform of the ability to see is this rhodopsin molecule, in, which is a microscopic structure, of course, a protein inside the rods and cones in the retina in the back of the eye. And similar, there is other nerve cells for smelling, chemoreceptors, uh, and tasting, and mechanical receptors for pain, uh, touch, pressure, temperature, and vibration. It is these the active part inside these nerve cells that are the physical base, vattu, for these sense inputs, of which there are six. So, so much go for the vattus. Question 187. 
If karma decides everything, then man has no choice to choose between good and bad karma. Man is not free to do good karma. Uh, the Buddha didn't say that the karma determines all things. There are many things, for example, wind here, uh, the clouds now, uh, weather, comets falling down, sun and moon rising and so on. This is not determined by karma. And also many events, we get physical diseases when it's bad weather, or when we get radiation, we can get cancer and so on. This is not karmically related. This is physical. So uh, he was asked whether all experiences of pleasure and pain in this life was caused by karma, and this he categorically rejected. and said there are other causes also, but they're stacked up, so it's a probabilistic effect. Even if they are, uh, even if there are karmic influence of given uh, experiences and of things out in the world, in the, in the external world, and of pleasure, of pain, then it's not a, a complete conditioning. That they can say, for example, you can have 1% conditioning and 99% conditioning. Only in the case you have 100% karmic conditioning, then there's no choice. But it's almost, in all cases, almost all cases is in between. We know that the next Buddha, he will be called Mithya. So this is determined, this is the determined part of the future. It is 100% determined that he will be called Mithya. This will not be changed, it cannot be changed. But uh, what he will eat for dinner at his uh, seven year old birthday, this is not, uh, determined. But it's not completely free choice either. So random will be 0% conditioning, karmic conditioning, and 100% will be completely determinism. Then there will be no free choice. But even if there's 99% karmic conditioning, then there is still 1% free choice. It's just much, much more difficult to take that choice because you feel like you're, you're pushed in the back by some invisible force to take the karmic choice and not to take the, all the free choices you actually have. So it's a feeling of being compelled to do a certain thing, or to think a certain thing, or to uh, say a certain thing. That is the karmic conditioning. Same also with feeling pleasure or pain. Let's say uh, there is a, a karmic conditioning of 90% of feeling pain in a given situation. Then if you have 10 experiences of a similar kind, then you will feel pain in nine of them. And in one of them, in 10%, you'll feel pleasure. So it's a probabilistic effect. You cannot say in which order they come. In the other way, vice versa, if there's 10% uh, conditioning for feeling pain of a given, with a, in a given situation or in a given stimulus, then uh, you feel pain one out of 10 times, and the nine other times you'll feel pleasure. And this can usually be, it can be all kinds, 52%, 42%, and it's changeable all the time. It's modified all the time. So it's almost never the case that there is 100% karmic conditioning. Only in very rare events, there is 100% conditioning. We'll go through an example in the karma story. So, karma is a fractional conditioning between 1% and 99%. And this then influences uh, the outcome of different observations of experiences and thereby also of feeling pleasure or pain. It is then stacked up, these uh, chances, let's say there is a 20% chance of uh, becoming sick from a karmic cause in a given situation. Then if there is an external cause, for example, you have a cold situation where you are undercooled, you are, you are going in wet clothes because of rain weather and so on, this add another 20%. And then uh, there's a one man, he has a, a flu, he, he cough you in the head with uh, some virus, then you get another 20%. Then there's 20% karmic conditioning, 20% weather conditioning, and 20% virus conditioning. Then there's 60% conditioning to get the flu, and pneumonia due to the flu. So probabilities are additive. This goes for all probabilities, not only karmic probabilities. But the probabilities always fall in the 1 to 99% and rarely in the 0% or 100% class. Very rarely. But it can happen, can happen. Then we'll say if it's non 0%, it's complete, then it's completely random what you will experience in a given situation, in a given stimulus, in a given event. While on the opposite hand, if the conditioning, karmic conditioning is 100%, then 
we can say is destiny, that uh, you are prone to f feel that pleasure or pain, whatever the comic says, or this or that will happen. And then it will have, if you have come into the same conditions uh, 10 times, or let's say 100 times, in all 100 times, the same, same thing will happen. Let's say you go out to the street, you'll be run down by a car. You'll be, if you go out to the street 100 times, you'll be run down by a car 100 times. Or if you, if the opposite way around, that you, you shouldn't be run down by a car, then you won't be run by. The, the car will miss you in the last second 100 out of 100 times. So it's a probabilistic effect. It's a chance effect. It's almost never destiny. But only in the case of 100% conditioning, then we can call it destiny. But it's a rare special case. So free will is always present, but to different degrees. Already at 50%, uh, you have 50% free will and 50% conditioning. Then you feel con considerable influence from this common conditioning. And it's difficult to make a free choice, unless you're aware that there is a free choice. You have to use considerably will, force of mind, to make the right choice. In, in, in a conditioning of 50%. 80% conditioning is, sin, uh, is very difficult. And 99% conditioning then is almost impossible, but not fully impossible. I hope this clears the issues of free will versus karmic conditioning, which is a fractional probability effect. I'll give the Sivaka Sutta uh, down here where the Buddha pointed out that natural non karmic causes for experiences, uh, pleasure and pain is, is given. Where he was asked directly that some Brahmins say that karma determines everything. If karma determines everything actually, then it will be possible to attain purity. Then the whole thing will be destiny. Because it, you already deposited causes for everything that happens in your future life. And it doesn't make sense to try to do anything good or bad. Because as one Brahmin he called it, it's just like a, 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 a piece of a, a thread that is coiled up and then it's this ball of thread rolls, runs out. And there's no chance of modifying. But that's not the case. It's not destiny. It's a fractional, probabilistic effect. There's always a free choice when the conditioning is not 100%. And it's almost never is. This then also gives responsibility for our actions, for our choices. Even in the 99% probability, you cannot say, ah, karma is my excuse. Because you, you, you did have a free choice. It was difficult yes, to use, yes, but there still was a free choice to do this or that, to do good and to abstain from doing evil. The karma story is about seven monks uh, who experiences, they go into a cave, and here you can speak about 100% uh, conditioning. They go into a cave to sleep for the night. It's a heavy rain weather. Then the rain weather, it causes, causes a mudslide and it frees a big, huge stone. The stone tumbles down the mountain and f falls right in front of the cave and closes the mouth of the cave. And they're locked inside there for seven days without having any food or any drink. And uh, especially, Absence of water, anything to drink for seven days is a, a severe torture. So uh, then the villagers say they come up there and hear them in there and dig them out. For seven days after they were locked up there, they, they come out. And then they, they go back to the Buddha and ask how come that is. And then he looks back into their past and see that they were boys traveling together. Uh, and then they, they were sons of uh, cattle herders, very rough people, huh? And so these boys, they catch an iguana, a reptile, large reptile, you see here. And then they uh, put it inside a hole in an anthill and put a stone in front of the hole. So the, ant, the iguana, the reptile could not come out for seven days and could not have anything to drink despite the, the hot weather. And for this reason, the Buddha told, for 14 lives in a row, they have been caught up in a cave under various conditions for seven days without food or drink. And then you can say, in that case, when they go into this cave, these seven, 
reincarnations of these seven boys who did this evil karma to the reptile, to the iguana, then there is a 100% chance that they will be locked up. By this or that condition. This or that condition. So they were locked up, and now they have escaped, they have exhausted this effort. And now they will go scot-free in there, if there's no remaining trace of karma left in their future lives. So you can say, they sealed their destiny by locking this iguana up as a boy, as a boy. So they probably f found some perverse joy in it, in uh, torturing this iguana, but then maybe repented it later on and then set it free. But then it has been in there for seven days. So they had to experience the echo effect of that for 14 lives in a row. That's a very common example of uh, karma, action, intentional action, and then later uh, vipaka, effect of action, or falla, fruit of action. As the Buddha noticed, all beings are born created, formed, shaped, and conditioned by their karma. They are owner, inheritor, and debtor to their karma. Whatever they do, good as bad, the effect of that will be theirs only. So this one should think about and be very aware about in every action in every thought, in every speech, whether this action is colored by, tainted by, or mixed by any degree of ignorance, doubt, uncertainty, any degree of greed, attraction, lust, desire, and any degree of aversion, irritation, opposition. Since that, then we can foresee it is to be expected that the future effect of that karma, of that intentional action, whether thinking something, mental karma, saying something, verbal karma, or doing something with the body, bodily karma, that will come out as pain, as suffering in the future. This is worth noticing. Then I would like to uh, say thank you to the supporters and also notice that uh, support is still very welcome uh, especially on the patreon page i'll put the link down here below or as giving food if you like to give traditional dana then i'll give the link down here below thank you for your attention and have a nice day namo tasso Bhagavatto, Arahatto, Samma Sambuddhasa, Worthy, Anabha, and perfectly self-enlightened, was a blessed Buddha, indeed. Thank you. As long as his life lasts, I hereby take refuge in the Buddha. I hereby take refuge in the Dhamma. I hereby take refuge in the Sangha. I hereby seek shelter in the Buddha for the second time. I hereby seek shelter in the Dhamma for the second time. I hereby seek shelter in the Sangha for the second time. I hereby request protection from the Buddha for the third time. I hereby request protection from the Dhamma for the third time. I hereby request protection from the Sangha for the third time. The three refuges he is hereby taken. I hereby accept and undertake the training rule of avoiding all killing. I hereby accept and undertake the training rule of avoiding all stealing. 
I hereby accept and undertake the training role of avoiding all sexual abuse. I hereby accept and undertake the training role of avoiding all dishonesty. I hereby accept and undertake the training role of avoiding all alcohol and drugs as long as this life lasts. From now on, I can hereby rightly consider myself to be a true Buddhist with the blessed Buddha as my teacher, as the next Buddha, the noble Arya Ajitta Mateya will say, you can come as you like, but you pay as you go. Thank you for your contribution and have a nice